Okay. Uh, I can go for the. Can you see my slides? Uh, yeah, it's coming. It's coming. Uh, you can see your screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay, coming. and you can hear me properly. Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. Uh, should I also try the my uh, video, uh, or would it work without it? So it's okay if you don't want to. It's okay. Perfectly. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, it's fine. So let's start. So good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon and a welcome, warm welcome to everyone. First of all, apologies for starting this live a little deep uh, because we, we delayed uh, with our live session today because of some technical glitch we were facing. So apologies for that. And again, we welcome you for today's live, pro, uh, live session, live uh, public lecture on studying galaxy evolution using hydrodynamical stimulation. Uh, we, we have with us expert Ankit Singh. Please Fellow Korea Institute of Advanced Studies, South Korea. We welcome you, sir. And today we'll be talking about the galaxy in the local universe. Have different metaphors, stars, formation, rates, and color indicating various stages of galaxy evolution. How galaxy have evolved in these different entities has been a question that has puzzled astronomers for centuries. In recent years, due to increasing uh, conceptual power, large-scale stimulation have provided new vital insight into our understanding of the universe. In this talk today, we will have a brief discussion on the theory behind the cosmological stimulation. We will explore how the stimulation's results help improve our knowledge of how galaxies evolve in this universe. So, uh, Ankit, we welcome you for today's live with us and uh, all the online participants are eagerly waiting to get some detailed information about this topic. So, over to you. Thank you so much. Sorry for the delays on my part. Actually, uh, there were some technical glitches. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunities to talk. Uh, opportunity to talk. And my association with planetarium has been for years. Uh, I actually my astronomy journey started with narrow planetarium when I was uh, in my bachelor's, and then I did uh, many projects with the doctor, late doctor Ratnasri. And um, it's a pleasure to give a talk here. So today uh, I'll be telling you. A uh, a brief, uh, very simplistic uh, overview of how the simulations actually help us in studying the galaxy evolution. And uh, we'll, we'll take a look at some practical examples as well. So let's begin. So this is the uh, outline of my talk, which would be a basic introduction. Then we'll go into uh, uh, some basic, uh, can you see my mouse uh, as well? Yeah, so uh, we'll go into the details of uh, simulations, how they are, how they work, and we'll also uh, I'll also display you a, a practical example on how observation and simulations play hand in hand, and then we'll end with the summary. So uh, going, uh, what is uh, going first to the observation? What is the approach in astronomy? So uh, so we see the universe. Uh, currently as it is uh, in observation. We don't have the luxury of going back in uh, time and uh, re-simulating uh, the universe and re-visiting uh, how it started. We are trying to interpret it as um, as it is uh, at the current time. We also have our understanding of the physics that we have, uh, and thus we try to uh, basically make out of uh, what uh, our uh, galaxy evolution uh, would have been. So what we do is we click uh, in layman's terms, uh, we uh, click a bunch of pictures, which we call observations, try to go as deep as possible, as uh, thorough as possible in, in those observations, and try to reenact or recreate or understand uh, the history of the universe through using those pictures. Now, uh, and 
just to give a brief uh, analogy, it would be like, let's say you are given the task to study the Earth and human uh, humans in the uh, on living on Earth at this particular moment, your approach would be uh, the same. You would try to capture uh, images of uh, human at different stage, as a baby, as an adult, as an old age. Uh, then you would try to sit together and uh, figure out how they would have evolved. And uh, at some point you would say, oh, maybe this baby grew up into an adult and then uh, maybe died as an old age. So uh, this is uh, what we have. We, we live in uh, at t equal to now, let's say, and we try to uh, take observation and understand the universe. Whereas in the simulation, what we have is uh, we use the physics that we know, that we understand uh, up to a certain degree of uh, satisfaction. And then uh, we try to uh, say that given the physics that we know, uh, if the universe started with some, um, with some initial condition, how, did it, uh, how would it evolve? And then uh, we evolve the simulation starting at some late, uh, or some at t equal to zero, let's say, and we evolve it to t equal to 100, and then match it with the observation. If it matches our expectation, uh, then we, we know that whatever is our understanding of physics is correct, and we don't have to, uh, and uh, then we can ask the question of how the universe would grow in future, or how these galaxies would evolve in future. Uh, but in case they don't ma match, uh, which is the case for most of the most of the simulation, then we know that there is a uh, there is some weak link in our um, uh, in our understanding of the universe and understanding of physics, and we try to make it better as uh, as much as we can as uh, as we uh, perform new and new simulations. Uh, so these are the two contradictory approaches. In one, in one, in one approach, you have the uh, universe as it is. You uh, you collect uh, evidences of evolution, and then you try to make uh, make a sense out of what we are seeing. And then the other, you take what you already know and you evolve, and then match with the observations to understand our uh, uh, the galaxy evolution. Uh, so a basic overview of what we are seeing basically in observation. So on the left uh, side, you can see uh, a, a, a kind of a history of universe. Uh, and the x-axis shows the time since Big Bang. So Big Bang started, uh, let's say at t equal to zero, and we are at uh, at 14 billion years now. So uh, what we are seeing in uh, these using these telescopes in various places on Earth. And using various uh, uh, bands or uh, wave bands of observation is uh, a small portion of the universe. Uh, since our telescopes also have some sensitivity limits, we also have some technical limits uh, um, doing observation from Earth or doing observation even using satellite. We see only a small fraction of the universe in different wavelengths. And uh, to give you an idea on the right up, uh, up plot, you can see that. Uh, we are seeing about this 46 billion light years only. And the uh, observable universe can be much uh, greater than that. Uh, or the actual universe can be much greater than that. It's only the light from this uh, small portion of the universe has only reached us uh, so that we are able to observe them. Uh, on the bottom right, you see a plot from SDSS, uh, Stone Distance uh, Sky Survey. Uh, one of the most popular um, optical um, uh, surveys that uh, that we have, and uh, what you see is uh, so the don't be confused by the black uh, regions here. It's the is that uh, because of the Milky Way in the sight, line of sight, we are not able to observe it, uh, observe galaxies in that region very well. Uh, where, whereas where Milky Way is not present, we can uh, from ground. We can observe galaxies, and each dot in this uh, plot uh, is an is a galaxy. So you can see the galaxy on a larger scale, and uh, the the x-axis represents the redshift. Redshift means that higher the redshift means you are looking uh, further away, and thus you are also looking back in time. So um, you can see from uh, from the bottom right plot that the galaxies are not distributed 
uh, homogeneously. Uh, they are uh, in, in some kind of a clumpy filamentary uh, structure. And, uh, but if you look, if you squint your eyes and look it up uh, and smooth these distribution over some area, you would see that it is approximately similar, uh, uh, similar values in, uh, in different regions of the universe. So uh, what, what uh, do we see in our local universe? We are, uh, as I said, we are uh, seeing around 100 million light years around our uh, galaxies or something. And uh, our Milky Way is part of a local group, which is, um, uh, which has about 54 members and growing as, um, as more and more galaxies are discovered. And then uh, there are three famous galaxies like Andromeda, Tangulum, and all that. Um, this group of clusters is also a member of uh, a supercluster, which is called Virgo supercluster. And it is said that we are, uh, as a group, a uh, local group, we are heading towards that uh, Virgo supercluster. Well, this was the understanding a few years ago. And then uh, we, we found this, uh, uh, a new structure called uh, Linacia, in which you see these uh, galaxies I was showing you. The red dots here represent the galaxies which are coming towards us, and blue represents the galaxies which are going away. And if you trace that uh, structure, and uh, these lines represent the velocity field, uh, what we uh, understand is that these galaxies in the local universe are moving towards a greater uh, great attractor, which is a, a supercluster, a giant supercluster, uh, uh, which is even bigger than our uh, Virgo supercluster that we initially thought we were falling into. And as you can see in this uh, in this video, YouTube video, uh, courtesy Cosmic Flows collaboration, uh, that. Uh, these dots, all of these dots are galaxies. And you see our Virgo cluster is only a small part of this larger uh, cluster uh, called Lanaxia that we are talking about. Our Milky Way resides in uh, our local group and it is falling inside the Virgo supercluster. But then Virgo cluster is falling inside Lanaxia. Uh, so on the, uh, so we have a greater understanding in the, in these past years of our position uh, or in the universe, our local universe. So, uh, but how does our local universe come into being? So if we, uh, uh, this is what our current understanding is or the current model would be that you had a big bang and then after that uh, matter was formed and uh, then uh, the gas started uh, cooling, the electron proton combined we had a uh, birth of atoms like hydrogen. And then uh, as, as the universe progressed, this gas cooled inside uh, dark matter halos, it formed stars, and uh, then eventually falling galaxies. And what we are seeing here at the end of 3.7 billion years is, uh, is galaxies of different shapes, different morphology, different kinds, and different uh, stages of evolution. So, uh, how we got from uh, the Big Bang to our current uh, uh, galaxies of different uh, in different stages of, uh, of evolution is the main question that we are asking, and that's the that's the uh, that's the grand question which has puzzled. So, if universe started with these small perturbations as we see in the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is a uh, which is uh, which traces the un universe when it was very, very young. And we see that uh, the radiation there is more or less very uniform. It is very isotropic. And, but it has small, small fluctuations, as you can see on the left-hand side. These are like, if you subtract the uh, mean temperature from the uh, cosmic uh, microwave background, this is what you would get. Somewhere uh, the temperature is hotter, and somewhere temperature is cooler. The, where, wherever temperature is hotter, we say that the gas is falling inside those halos. And, uh, as, and as the galaxy evolves, uh, uh, it should lead to these all different kind of galaxies that we see today. So 
this is the the combining the two is is the challenge is what we call study of ga galaxy evolution and that's what uh, all the astronomers all the simulation uh, scientists they are trying to address and uh, so what edwin huppel did in uh, in his study was that he looked at these galaxies of different uh, morphology and he tried to classify them he gave uh, is what we call the famous tunic uh, classification of galaxies that you have galaxies on your right side which are uh, disky galaxies it is uh, they are uh, the matter is distributed in the plane and on the left you see the galaxies which are uh, which which are not spiral which are very elliptical that means they have a 3d distribution of galaxy uh, of uh, stellar content uh, which is supported by the um, by by pressure rather than rotation which is in the case of the spiral galaxies on your right and also galaxies might also have um, uh, bars uh, which is uh, the bottom right uh, thing here that it would have a bar like structure in the between so what what he could uh, come up at that time uh, at that point was that since uh, these elliptical galaxies uh, lack features uh, they must be uh, the one combining to form these feature uh, pro feature uh, spiral galaxies which is very uh, uh, now we understand which is a, a wrong understanding of the galaxy evolution uh, or which uh, the galaxy evolution can uh, be much more complicated than that um so uh, what we see in the galaxies are the stars mostly if you are looking at the optical uh, uh, optical wavelength so how the star uh, form and how they are uh, they are influenced by different mechanism is uh, is a field of study that is currently pursued in uh, astrophysics people uh, have written papers about it for for decades and this plot kind uh, this uh, diagram kind of summarizes what is happening so you have star formation the galaxies uh, the stars are formed by the gal uh, by the gas cooling then you have also have stars going supernova they uh, they end their life they go in bursty uh, way and then uh, the gas is thrown out now uh, uh, and a lot of energy is released in this plot what we are showing is how the star formation is influenced by uh, by the processes on the upper side on the uh, as you go up the processes are fast and as you go left the processes are internal to the galaxy if you go to the right the the uh, the processes are external to the galaxy and as you go bottom the processes are, are slow and this is not to like don't think too much about this uh, diagram but what i wanted to give you uh, a sense uh, of um, of complexity is that each of these processes mentioned uh, on this diagram uh, have uh, had uh, many papers written on them so just understanding how the stars form how do they evolve and how uh, different uh, environment effect star formation is a uh, is a field of study in itself and uh, this is what uh, has driven astronomers uh, uh, for decades um so in a simplistic way this is what a galaxy would look like uh, and you would have a disky a disky structure if you are talking about the spiral galaxies of course you would have some stars which are uh, near the very center of the galaxies uh which which uh, and we have a uh, we have a spherical distribution which are bulge then you also have small uh, clumps of stars which are in the uh, which are a little farther away from the disk uh, but residing inside the dark matter halo which we call as um the uh, the globular clusters and then of course there is a center uh, of the galaxies which uh, we now for sure has a supermassive black hole so this is the basic structure of the galaxy but where does so these are the stellar distribution which which we know but how does uh, the gas come into picture so the gas we cannot see it uh, uh, in uh, we don't see it in optical uh, observations we see them in through various lines 
And so uh, what what our understanding is currently, there are two modes of uh, accretion. One is called the hot mode, in which uh, the gas is uh, cooling down upon the uh, upon the main uh, disk isotropically. And on the other uh, on the other uh, process called cold mode accretion, in which uh, the galaxies, uh, the gas forms filamentary like structure and it goes directly towards the uh, towards the galaxy. And as uh, as the galaxies evolve, these two uh, modes of accretion uh, would be at some point one mode would be dominant and the other the other mode would be dominant. Um, now uh, we go to uh, cosmological simulation and how do they work? Now, uh, as I told you, we we have uh, a simulation and we start them from some initial condition. So, what are what is the initial condition? We know at larger scale of the universe, uh, the universe is isotropic and homogeneous. So, we take a box, a 3D box, and we populate it with uh, particles. Uh, let's say thousand particles, or let's say one million particles, or ten million particles. And we uh, we spread them isotropically and uh, homogeneously. Then, uh, since we are simulating only a small portion of the universe, uh, which is not uh, the size of the entire universe, uh, let's say we are simulating only five megaparsec or fifty megaparsec or hundred megaparsec, which is not at all uh, uh, comparatively uh, large enough for simulating the entire universe. So for this small box, we uh, we say that we have periodic boundary condition. That means that all the uh, all the galaxies which are uh, all the particles which are at the edge of the box, they are influenced by the galaxies uh, by the particles which are on the other uh, edge near the other other edge of the box. So all the particles which are on the extremely right will be influenced by the particles which are uh, on the extreme left, and thus. Which is true for each direction. You would come come up with you have uh, different copies of these particles uh, around your box. So this is called the periodic boundary condition. And then, but you need to form the galaxies. If all the particles are uniform and uh, they are uh, attracted at the same time by all the other particles in a homogeneous condition, you wouldn't have structures being formed. So what you need to do is you need to have some uh, perturbations there, which we also see in the uh, cosmic microwave background radiation. We saw there, as I showed you earlier, that there are uh, places where the gas is hot, uh, and there are places where the uh, not the gas, but the, the radiation is hot, and, uh, and there are places where radiation is cool, which means that uh, in the places where it is hot, the gas is falling inside. Uh, the dark matter halos, and for where the uh, the gas is cool, that means that it is moving away. Uh, it is not falling inside the halo. So we uh, we give this information in our uh, isotropic uh, and homogeneous boundary condition, and thus we perturb our uh, our particles in such a way that it represents this uh, uh, this perturbation. And then we evolve the simulation. And how does the simulation would evolve? This is an example. Uh, this is a very uh, small uh, box. And you, you can have, starting from the initial condition, which is very homogeneous and uh, isotropic, you would have uh, the structures forming as the gravity plays its role. Now remember, we have not, uh, till now, not introduced gas. It's just uh, some particles, which are dark matter particles. We, what we call dark matter particles uh, in simulation are the particles that don't uh, have any, any other kind of interaction, just the gravitational interaction. So you start with these particles, you just let them uh, evolve gravitationally, and what you end up is a different structure, as we see in, the, in our local universe. Remember the picture of our local universe? It was very filamentary non homogeneous and um, and had various uh, clumps so these clumps is what we uh, call uh, the small clumps the small dots 
as we uh, we had we call them halos in which the galaxies form and uh, the largest lumps as they gather around we call them clusters uh, which would have around hundreds to thousands of uh, these small halos and then there are superclusters in which uh, would there would be thousand even uh, their combination of basically two clusters so there would be their mass would be 10 to the power 14 solar masses which is like uh, four times the uh, the mass of Milky Way, or 100 times the mass of Milky Way. Oh, sorry, <laughs> 100 times the mass of the Milky Way, or 1,000 times the mass of the Milky Way. So they can uh, go uh, up to the masses of 10 to the power 14, 15. For example, Coma supercluster has a mass of about 10 to the power 14 solar masses, and Milky Way's mass would be 10 to the power 12 solar masses. So this is uh, what you get from the basics. So this is uh, uh, just some. Uh, N body simulation. This is dust, which is uh, dark matter particles uh, evolving from Earth uh, from initial condition. Now we come to the uh, regime of what we call hydrodynamical simulation, in which uh, we know that the, uh, the universe also has baryons, it has gas in it. So uh, we, we introduce gas uh, in, in the simulation, but how do we introduce gas? Because uh, because introducing gas is computationally uh, computationally very expensive, so that depends upon the kind of computation you have. So if you have um, if you have lesser uh, uh, computation, you cannot resolve scales of uh, subgrade scale. You would have to do away with kiloparsec scale resolution. We'll come to that, but uh, the gas can be uh, gas can be simulated in two ways, which we call Lagrangian description, and one is called Eulerian description. In which, in the first case, you uh, you say that I smooth over the gas particles and uh, uh, using a kernel, and we say that okay, uh, light dark matter. These are also particles. It uh, and they interact gravitationally, but also have uh, other effects like heating, cooling, uh, uh, forming stars, uh, and uh, then going supernova afterwards. And then uh, in the Eulerian description, what you have is that you have some uh, grid points. You uh, discretize your volume into various grids, and you follow the uh, value of fluid at these grid points. And um, and depending upon what kind of uh, uh, computation you are doing, you can have grids which are multi-level uh, in one region where the density is larger and you want higher resolution and coarser in the region where you are not interested in following the galaxy evolution. I mean, just to give you an idea of uh, what, how uh, do we uh, give the gas uh, into the simulation. Now, uh, since we are introducing gas, you need to have uh, the star formation. And how do we form stars? As I showed you in the earlier slide, it's very complex. Uh, so uh, what we uh, describe the evolution of these gas particles is, uh, is with the help of what we call subgrid physics, in which since we are not able to resolve the scale of uh, subparsec level, due to computational uh, challenges. We are uh, most of the time working with hundreds of parsecs. What we say is that what happens at these levels, for example, what happens to a single star, we are not able to resolve. But what happens to hundreds of stars, I'm able to resolve. So you have a prescription of physics of what, uh, of what these gas or stellar particles do on a global scale. And this is where each and every simulation differs from each other. This prescription can be different for different simulations, uh, depending upon what uh, your understanding or of physics is and what you are trying to achieve. Uh, then you also have uh, feedback models, uh, which is 
how the gas is thrown out uh, uh, from a galaxy once the star reaches its end stage. And thus we are not, uh, and also in this case, we are not concerned about a single star. Uh, since we are not able to resolve subparsec scale, what we would say that uh, on a global scale, let's say 100 stars or 1000 stars, how uh, the gas would be thrown out if they are evolving. Okay, so this is uh, a basic introduction of, uh, of hydro simulation. And uh, so you saw the dark matter simulation, how it forms different structures. If you had gas inside them, those uh, blue dots that you saw here, they would also they would also have gas inside them. They would also have stellar particles. They would also have uh, gas lying around in uh, voids and uh, and supercluster and clusters. And those are the things: the stars, uh, gas are the things that we see in observation. We are not seeing the dark matter particles, but we know uh, there are indirect evidences of it, uh, it, being, it uh, being there. Uh, but what we are seeing using different wavelengths of observation, uh, observation of different wavelengths, uh, that what do the stars look like? What, do the gas, what does the gas look like in different temperatures uh, traced using different lines uh, of emission, and uh, what is uh, what are what is the properties of galaxies in clusters? What is the properties of uh, galaxies in superclusters? That is what we are observing. So we are observing baryons, and that's why hydrodynamical simulation in recent years. Uh, earlier, they were it was not possible to do uh, uh, hydrodynamical simulations of uh, reasonable accuracy. But now, due to uh, due to computation, we are able to do it. So we are able to compare with the observations now. Uh, but there is a question of the resolution. So what, where are we lacking? Why can't we resolve so much? The reason is that uh, the mass resolution uh, currently that we have, it can, uh, if you are resolve, if you are simulating uh, uh, a, a sample of the universe which is of, let's say, 50 megaparsecs or 500 megaparsec, it can range from 10 to the power 6 to 10 to the power 9 solar masses or more. So that means that uh, your star, which is one solar mass, two solar mass, 100 solar mass, we are not able to resolve those. We are resolving hundreds and thousands of stars, uh, and we call them one particle. So this, these are the stellar particles, as we call them. Uh, then you have the uh, spatial resolution, which is how much uh, space, uh, how much you can resolve in space. Which means that uh, how many parsecs are we able to uh, study uh, without uh, being uh, computationally very, very uh, heavy. So, uh, and these spatial resolutions, uh, of course, need to be higher and higher. Currently, uh, if you're studying uh, uh, a large scale box, let's say 1000 megaparsec or 100 megaparsec, you would be able to resolve up, up to from 100 uh, parsec to one kiloparsec or in that vicinity. Uh, if you're studying a small box, let's say you're only concerned about uh, galaxies and not the large scale structure of the universe, then you can resolve even more, which is, around 70 parsec or 35 parsec or even 10 parsec. But still you are not able to resolve individual stars, uh, individual, um, uh, yeah, individual stars. So you adopt different, different techniques, uh, something like what we call adaptive mesh refinement, as I explained to you earlier, interesting regions are refined more, boring regions are refined less. Uh, so this is what a, barrier, a hydrodynamical simulation would look like. So you can see here the same uh, simulation, uh, and we are uh, we are representing different quantities, which can also be observed in some sense, uh, like metallicity represented by Z, the temperature of the gas represented by T, uh, stellar mass uh, represented by M star, uh, H1 fraction, uh, X, uh, chi H1. And then over 
lower density like how many uh, galaxies are more compared to the mean uh, compared to the mean number of density so you can see that these are the observables that we can obtain from our simulation and thus now we can go ahead and match them uh, with observation uh, and how do we do it so now we come to a practical example so this is uh, uh, what I did in my PhD, uh, a fraction of what I did in my, in my PhD. So we come to a practical example and how these simulation and observations are used. So uh, we need, we would need two concepts here. One is called the color in, uh, in astronomy. So color in astronomy is basically, uh, uh, is, it is defined using uh, observation in two bands of uh, different wavelengths. And uh, when we see, look at the galaxies, we see them, either they are red in color. So this is what we are talking about, the optical, uh, optical wavelengths here. So either they appear very red, uh, like uh, when you see them through SPSS or any other optical telescope, or, um, or they appear very blue uh, when you look at them. Now, uh, these colors, uh, give us the information about how much is dust present in uh, in these galaxies, which are complex compounds of uh, of different uh, uh, of different elements, and then uh, gas, which is molecular gas or ionized gas or um, or neutral gas, but of course not in the optical wavelength. These are observed in different wavelengths. But yes, so this color can give you information of indirect information about these, uh, 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 these components of galaxies. And then how do astronomers basically uh, analyze colors? They analyze colors uh, by breaking them into, uh, by using something which is spectroscopy, that observing it in, uh, in different uh, wavelengths. Uh, and then we take, uh, how the galaxy, how bright does the galaxy appear if I'm looking at it from one wavelength? And how bright does it appear when I'm looking at it in a different wavelength? Waveband mean, me, uh, meaning that, uh, let's say, a uh, few angstrom width, uh, let's say 400 to 600 uh, angstrom, and then 600 to 800 angstrom. And uh, I observe my galaxies in these two wavelengths, and I look how bright it is. Then I take the difference between the brightness, and that is what we call as the color. Uh, so when I plot this uh, color and I, on the y-axis, and I plot these uh, brightness on the x-axis, what I see is a very distinct uh, kind of plot in which uh, there is a line kind of structure which forms, which are called the red sequence, where all these elliptical galaxies or, or old galaxies reside, which are very featureless, remember what we showed in the Hubble diagram. And then in, there is uh, something called Green Valley, where galaxies are uh, in, uh, they have very uh, different features from elliptical and uh, blue galaxies, or they might have similar features. Uh, so, um, and in the blue cloud, what we see are the galaxies which are very young. They are mostly disky uh, in uh, morphology. Uh, and thus are uh, what we believe is that these, uh, spi sorry for the spelling mistake, spiral galaxies. Uh, spiral galaxies are the one that have uh, evolved during uh, in different ways to form this red sequence or a passively evolving galaxy, which have low or no star formation. And this intermediate state of galaxy evolution is what is captured in what we call green valley galaxy. Uh, so this is our understanding. This may or may not be true. They, they, they have been many papers which have been written over the years, verifying this claim, uh, uh, disputing this claim, and uh, uh, reaffirming our understanding of uh, how the galaxies evolve. But this is an observational fact that uh, if you plot them, color versus luminosity, they appear like this. So, uh, so what is 
the large scale structure of the universe i showed you in the css slide uh, in the introduction now we have uh, uh, what we call filament uh, as an environment so you have you see here there are regions of this uh, universe which are very featureless each dot is a galaxy and there are regions where there are no yellow dots there are regions with uh, filamentary uh, structure uh, uh, very filamentary structure and then you have uh, then you have points where um, there are clumps which are called uh, clusters or superclusters now uh, what we do in this study is we what uh, is we study the filament environment but just to give you an idea of how large is large since it's a very relative world so you see all these dots are as galaxy and this is for example andromeda galaxy what we see in the plot above and if you zoom in into one of these branches of andromeda you would uh, get uh, the you can see various billions of stars there so if you for example you are on sun you are there in those billion dots you zoom out you are still in one galaxy and then each galaxy has billions of stars and then you zoom out from a galaxy to a larger picture you have billions of galaxies so this is what is large when we say large scale structure uh, so this is uh, a plot of coma supercluster in which uh, i have represented the different environment which is uh, the number density around a galaxy in different colors the gray point here are low density regions black point here are high density regions called clusters and the red dots here are intermediate density regions uh, so once you uh, quantify these environment what i did was i plotted the color of uh, galaxy with the distance from the spine of the filament so if you imagine the filament to be a cylindrical structure the axis of the uh, the distance from the axis of the cylinder is what i'm plotting on the x axis and uh, on the y axis is what we initially said color was so uh, g minus r is a color optical color so uh, what we see here is that the, as you go towards the spine of the filament uh, we see the galaxy color so overall uh, median galaxy color becomes uh, redder so galaxies which are um, which are closer to the uh, spine of the filament uh which which is closer to the cylindrical axis of the filament they are redder that means they are producing less number of stars so uh, there is some process some external processes which are happening uh which are preventing the gas from cooling down and forming stars either the gas is blown away by something or this gas supply uh, is cut off why that happens is a question that can be answered in different studies and uh, that's what research uh, is has been going on and the similar feature is also uh, shown in the uv which is the uh, second plot so in on the left side we are plotting the uv color and on the uh, on the, the the top plot is the optical color so both show this thing that as you are going towards the spine of the filament within a distance of 1 megaparsec the galaxies are becoming redder this is observation uh, in optical and uv now uh, i use a simulation called eagle simulation which is a, a hydrodynamical simulation which uses different uh, numerical techniques it fixes the feedback parameter it fixes the star formation parameter in a different unique way and i try to verify if the same thing happens so here i take a slice from the simulation as comparable to the coma supercluster as we have we quantify the environment we get a mock image in fact various mock images and then we plot the same thing now look at the top a plot here you can see the same feature here that within as you are going towards the spine of the filament the galaxies are becoming redder so they are uh, within uh, a certain distance from the filament 
becoming uh, deficient in gas or they are stopping their star formation. So filament, uh, which is not directly observable in, uh, in the observation because it's a very low uh, density, hot gas. Uh, it's, it's dictated by low density, hot gas, and we are not able to observe it. Although half of the uh, baryons are expected to reside in it. So there's a, this indirect evidence uh, in these two plots that I've shown, showed you that it does play a role in galaxy evolution. So you see how we uh, first did it using observation, and now we have confirmed it using, uh, using simulation. And thus, I leave you with the a summary that uh, the galaxy um, in the local universe, they have different properties as I showed you. And the large scale simulations, uh, as I showed you, had, uh, had do play a role in understanding galaxy evolution. And using these simulations and performing these mock observations, they help us in understanding our, uh, our uh, knowledge of uh, physical processes that, uh, that affect galaxy. And also uh, using uh, hydrodynamical simulation, they can uh, help you in uh, planning your future observations. Uh, if your understanding of physics is right, uh, your observation should show you uh, the expected results. If they don't show you the expected results, well, you have something new to explain. And thus, uh, the research goes on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ankit, for sharing this uh, complete overall detail about the uh, subject today we were discussing and with this we have lot many questions during the right. session so i'll be highlighting those so then you can take those okay so just kirat singh would like to ask what exactly subgrid physics mean mean by okay so uh, when we say subgrid physics that means so as the name suggests sub grid so when we say grid uh, uh, in in the simulation term is that imagine you have a box and you divide that box in 100 cubes right or 1000 cubes or uh, or million cubes now this is your resolution these millionth part by millionth part by millionth part this small cube that you have is your resolution you cannot uh, divide it further, just like a scale. If you have a uh, one feet scale, you have markings on it. Uh, you can see up to one millimeter in that, but you cannot measure anything which has lesser uh, length than one millimeter. So that is your resolution. Now, uh, when we talk about this universe, uh, let's say we did a megaparsec scale uh, uh, simulation, and we say that our, uh, our, our resolution is one kiloparsec, let's say. So this one kiloparsec by one kiloparsec by one kiloparsec, small q, is your uh, uh, spatial resolution. This is your grid. This, among all the grids, this is your grid uh, that you can resolve maximum. Now, beyond, beneath one kiloparsec, like in the actual of, of, uh, world, there goes a lot of physics, okay? Yeah, like the sun. Sun is not uh, one kiloparsec across. It is, uh, it is a few kilometers across, not few, but thousands of kilometers across. And it has a lot of physics that goes into it. It, it is evolving. It will die. It will, uh, it will uh, have red giant space or some space. And similarly, if you consider about a bunch of uh, suns, let's say a cluster, they also have a property that they have a mass distribution, they evolve in certain way, uh, they would die in a certain way. We are not able to resolve it in simulation. So what we try to do is try to get the global effect of this on our small box that we had created. So let's say 
uh, I mean, crudely speaking, we said that this bunch of stars, which I'm not able to resolve, would heat my uh, gas around it by 10 degrees. So what I do in my prescription or in my code of simulation, I would say that, okay, if you have 100 stars there expected to form in that uh, small box of resolution, 100 million by 100 million, then 100 million, whatever, they raise the temperature of that cell, minimum resolution cell, by 10 degrees. Okay. So, my, this 10 degree number or any physical parameter is, is given by physics, which is called subgrid physics, which comes from observation, and we try to uh, use that in simulation. In that. So, yeah. So I hope, uh, Jaskrit, you got the clarification. In, in case uh, you would like to ask anything, feel free to drop your query inside the chat. So, so next question we'll be taking, Shailu Singh, what type is our Milky Way galaxy? What is the? What, uh, what type is our Milky Way galaxy? Ah, I think uh, okay. she would like to know in which category of type, type uh, yeah. our Milky Galaxy falls in. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, initially, uh, when, uh, of course, as if you go to very remote corners of India, you can see Milky Way, right? Uh, and you see that it is beautifully arched across. And in fact, in planetarium, they can show you uh, the Milky Way yes. projected on the dome. <laughs> so, as you would observe, that it is kind of like a band in the sky, right? So, uh, that would mean uh, that it's a planar structure that would mean that it's a disky galaxy, okay? So that is one thing, that is very obvious uh, to us. Uh, now, whether uh, it has a bar or not is a topic of research. And recently, many papers have shown, many observations have shown uh, using uh, satellite data called Gaia, which is able to track the movement and motions of stars, uh, of all the stars, oh, not all the, all the stars, but a significant portion of the star, stars in our Milky Way. So what that data shows us, that it also has a hint of a bar at the center. So uh, you would say that Milky Way would be something which is SB type galaxy. You know, it is a spiral galaxy which has a bar. Uh, there is also observations of spiral structure being present in the galaxy. Since we are living inside the galaxy, we are uh, we are a part of the galaxy. It's really hard to observe the uh, the picture of galaxy from, let's say, what you can do with Andromeda galaxy. That you are not part of the galaxy. You can take a picture and see the bars there. Here, uh, there is a lot of observation that is needed. But yes, to answer your question, it would be something like a spiral with a hint of bar. So we'll be taking the next. What relativistic phenomena do we consider in developing these stimulations? Well, uh, not all, not at all. So, uh, if any relativistic uh, phenomena, if you are talking about general relativity, for example, they are not considered in this in generic hydrodynamical simulation. You can do uh, simulations which. Uh, have this different prescriptions of gravity. Let's say, for example, you want to check how the universe could evolve in uh, Newtonian uh, 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 gravity, which is not Newtonian, right? A uh, Mond type of gravity. You can de do these simulations, have a dif different prescription of uh, gravity there, but um, uh, the the generic prescriptions of uh, general relativity, like how the universe would, um, uh, how the universe would evolve, are considered only in the initial condition. So, in the initial condition, uh, when we say, when I showed you the picture of uh, this picture, uh, let me go back. So in this simulation, when we had this, uh, yeah, 
So we, when we said that we put in this information of CMB into these uh, initial condition, now CMB uh, from CMB to this initial condition requires a lot of uh, knowledge of our uh, general relativity or the cosmology in general. So that information uh, goes into this initial condition. So most of these uh, simulation would assume a lambda CDM universe, if you know what that is. That is, uh, your dark energy is constant and your dark matter is cold. That means it, it is not relativistic in speed. Uh, so this is uh, how it goes. But as far as the gravity or the evolution is concerned, you just take the same uh, formula as Newton prescribed, GMM by R squared, and nothing fancy. So next we'll uh, take, could, uh, could we tell why most big galaxies like Andromeda or Milky Way have a supermassive black holes in their center? That's a very good question. Actually, <laughs> it's a... Uh, it's, it's, it's a um, it's an active field of research. Like, why do these all these uh, galaxies have a supermassive black hole at the center? So, now, in um, in simulations, as as we do it, we say that if uh, since we are anyways, as I showed you, the mass resolution is ten to the power four, ten to the power six uh, solar masses. What we do is uh, in simulations, we do something called seeding of black holes, in which uh, if the gas inside a, a small cell, as I, as I was telling in the answer to the previous question, in that small uh, grid increases to, let's say, 10 to the power 6, 7 uh, solar masses, then that means that a small area, we convert it into a black hole. And we say that there is a black hole of 10 to the power 4 solar masses there which is called seeding of black holes. Now, this is very, um, this involves uh, many subtle descriptions, which means that where do you make this black hole go? Should it go into the center of the potential? Should it not go to the center of potential? Should it roam around in the galaxies as if there is a friction involved? Do we have enough uh, resolution to do that? So. In simulations, we uh, we can't say uh, uh, basically how these black holes form. We can say uh, or we can study how they evolve, like how they increase mass. You know, so a, a, a black hole that I seeded with 10 to the power 4 solar masses, how it grew to be 10 to the power 10, 8 solar masses. That I can study from my simulation because um, because I I have gas in the simulation which is evolving, I have stars which are evolving, so there's inflow of matter. Now, how this inflow is happening, I can study in my simulation. But the initial formation of the uh, central black hole is what is not known uh, how it happens. Uh, in this, so you can't answer it using simulation basically. You can try to, but uh, the, uh, there is very limited progress there. Uh, and similarly in the observation as well. So it's an open question. So maybe you can answer it in the in the future by your research that how these uh, supermassive black holes come into being, and how do they uh, uh, how do they evolve? So yeah. I think uh, Shalu, you got the insight about the, your query. So if there is no other question, we can wrap today's discussion because we already exceeded with the time. And thank you. Thank you once again, Ankit, for speaking on such uh, interesting topic and also some uh, some uh, of the topic inside this uh, discussion, we find we could have a separate discussion altogether on that. So, so yes, I'd be happy to yes, sure, shall thank you so much. Sorry, yeah, sorry for uh, the delay and, and, again. And also, no, no problem. Some technical glitches happens when we come online, so it's a part and parcel of the game. And also, student uh, Shallow is saying thank you very much, sir. I think she got the clarification on uh, the question she asked.
and also uh, can you suggest some reference book online resources on this topic for beginners i think this is really important uh, and relevant question before wrapping it you can answer this okay uh, so just to uh, do the um, so actually you need uh, a good laptop a decent laptop and you can do these simulations uh, uh, yourself at least uh, starting it so there's a there's a code called gadget 2 gadget as an electronic gadget gadget 2 if you go to the site of it it has a very good documentation in where uh, you can understand uh, what are the parameters and how it scores and then uh, there are uh, there are online courses uh, like in coursera uh, that you can do for galaxy evolution uh, now doing the simulation requires a certain bit of uh, of course expertise and uh, you need to first understand what per so for example these uh, a, a simulation for a single galaxy would have like 30 parameters you need to know what those 30 parameters mean so it requires a bit of expertise at least uh, a bachelor's uh, understanding of galaxy evolution but you don't need these fancy things uh, what you can do is you can take any book on galaxy evolution um for example uh, you can take frank shu or uh, or any other book uh, that you can find padmanabhan uh, another example uh, so you take these books and then you first study what is uh, bini and remain uh, another book you can take these book and try to understand and make sense of what is galaxy evolution and then uh, you can go ahead and do your own uh, research approach a professor never never be shy of asking questions email uh, people email me if you uh, wish to and uh, i'll give you the details uh, for for the uh, study yeah you can we will be happy to uh, make you associated with ankit in case you need any kind of help from nehru planetarium you are free uh, to write to us at nehruplanetarium@gmail.com and we can connect you uh with ankit or any other uh, expert you would like to get clarity on that topic so i think with this we'll wrap today's session thank you once again for your patience and time that you have given to us today and we really hope that discuss this discussion will uh let you some good thoughts and stimulation to your mind to go in the direction of uh, uh, your research or or thing you want to discover and thank you ankit for once again for coming online and sharing this uh, interesting topic with all the online participants and yes uh, very soon planetarium will be resuming with the upgrade upgraded projection system and then everyone is welcome to come here and i think in the coming time we'll be hosting all our lectures and workshop inside the planetarium so with this i think good afternoon and do take care thank of you so yourself much. see you thank you thank you ankit thank you yeah. see you uh, see you uh, some more interesting topic yeah thank you